All right, I think everyone's in from the waiting room. We're recording. Uh, welcome to the May 14th um, Energy, Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission meeting. This is an all Zoom affair. We have um, a quorum um, of members. And just to clarify, this is, uh, you probably noticed when you came on, this is being recorded. Um, we have um, members present, um, Deb Clemmer, Marissa Elkins, Angie Gregory, Ben Weil, Eric Winkler, didn't expect to see you, um, Lou, Louie, um, Pat McCarthy, and Tim Smith. So um, we definitely have a quorum. And first up on the agenda is um, public comments for items that are not otherwise on the agenda. So if anybody wants to make a public comment of any sort, now is the time to do that. Um, let me just check all the, see if I have any raised hands. Okay, um, Denise Lello, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I submitted a resolution, a draft resolution um, for uh, the commission to consider. And so I don't know if I, if this is the time for me to speak about that or if I wait, because I see it's on the agenda. So should I wait? Right. So since that is an item on the agenda, we'll hold all public comments related to that. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, and I don't see any other hands raised. Um. Okay, so I have on here just general updates from committee members. Um, later, we also have specific counselor updates and department head updates. So I don't know if anybody has any updates that necessarily, I just wanted to sort of have a blanket item for that um, before we launch into some of the other issues. Um, all right, no hands there. Uh, all right, so um, the next item is a resolution in support of an act relative to the future of clean heat in the Commonwealth and an act establishing a moratorium on new gas system expansions. Um, and so um, let me just, did everybody on the committee get a copy of that? It was also linked on the city's website if anybody needed it. Um, so I can't remember, was it, um, Denise or someone else who also forwarded Ben, did you, um, send that along to, I'm sorry, I'm having a, yeah, I just little, forwarded okay. it from Denise. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to take the lead on the conversation, um, and then we can open it up to, um, public comment or, um, how you want to do it. Well, I, I'm not sure, it, you know, if, it, if we've all had a chance to read it, then we know the gist of what it's about. Um, I think d d it makes sense to me to just ask Denise to share why she submitted it and what, you know, basically give her a discussion of it. Does that sound okay to you? Okay, sure. All right. So, Denise, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks. I think everybody knows me. Um, Denise Lello, and uh, I live at 35 Woodlawn Avenue in Northampton. Oh, not Angie, because, <laughs> okay. Um, I've been here from time to time. Um, uh, so um, I'm talking today as the uh, coordinator of the Northampton chapter of Mothers Out Front. Um, and uh, that is a organization that has um, chapters in 22 different cities and towns across Massachusetts and four different states. And um, so I... Um, this resolution is one that other communities are presenting to their councils. And the idea is to have a um, uh, uh, cities and towns um, uh, reflect their um, support for the legislation that's pending that would accomplish um, what we're calling triage and transition. So this model for moving away from fossil fuel to power our lives. So we have this pipe, gas pipe infrastructure, um, and uh, it's very leaky and old. <laughs> 
And so we have two things happening. One is that we need to fix these leaks for people's safety. And the other thing is we need to move away from them. So uh, large leaks are designated grade three SEI, significant environmental impact. So those have a footprint larger than 2000 square feet in rectangular extent. They only make up 7% of the leaks in Massachusetts, but they contribute 50% of our gas leak emissions. So ratepayers pay for fixing all leaks. So uh, grade three SEI leaks are part of the Massachusetts Gas System Enhancement Program, which um, people shortcut um, GSEP, it's a lot easier. And that started in 2014. So the idea was that that was gonna increase the safety and reliability of gas distribution system and incentivize utilities to speed up replacement of leaky infrastructure. Well, in October of 2021, they did a study called GSEP at the six year mark. And they found that even though pipe repair using advanced repair technologies is effective and cheaper, GSEP incentivizes utilities to replace pipes since that's how they make money. And so they will profit by replacing these pipes instead of just fixing them for the short term. So um, the costs of this are projected to cost Massachusetts ratepayers over $20 billion over time. And so instead, we need the utilities to be required to spend this money on their transition to electric heating and appliances. Ratepayers should not be saddled with paying for what are basically going to be stranded assets in 20 years. So if utilities remain motivated to profit from GSAP, you, customers with means are going to eliminate gas in their homes. And then the burden of paying for the pipeline replacements and expansions will fall on those who are least able to pay. So this resolution is part of the effort to change that trajectory and add Northampton to the list of cities and towns across the state, um, advocating that the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities live up to their mission statement. On their website, it says the mission of DBU is to ensure that consumers' rights are protected and that utility companies are providing the most reliable service at the lowest possible cost. Anyway, so what is this resolution designed to accomplish? There are just five bullets here. One is advocate for legislative action this session to support the future of Clean Heat Act, which is currently Senate Bill 2105 and House Bill 3203, and create a moratorium on new gas system expansion. And that's currently Senate Bill 2135 and House Bill 3237. Number two, support creation of a strategic plan for neighborhood by neighborhood transition from methane to clean heat. Somebody has to organize this. And this is just supporting the creation of a strategic plan. It's not requiring Northampton to do that, although that would be great if they could cooperate with the gas companies. Number three, support Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities to lead the planning process for a phased transition off methane. Number four, support use of advanced leak repairs where appropriate while retiring gas pipes by street segment or neighborhood, whatever works for the area, prioritizing areas with leak prone pipes. And number five, urge National Grid and Eversource to plan and implement a pilot network geothermal project in Northampton. We already have the Smith project going on, which will be great, but we need to start moving the rest of the city where we can to that kind of most efficient um, heating and cooling. And anyway, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, ben. Uh, so I, I guess I, I can, I, I want to ask a clarifying question, and then I also have some information, kind of news, news to share. Oh, good. Not, not quite <laughs> good. news, it's almost news, um, with regard to that thermal network uh, potentially supported by Eversource. Um, we are in talks with them about getting a district thermal network operated by them 
using Main Street's excavation as the opportunity to to actually put the the pipes in place that would basically um, that run uh, down from from Forbes down Main Street around um, uh, to the parking uh, the like by the parking garage uh, through Roundhouse um, and uh, and I learned a bunch of things in terms of tech technologically. Uh, I had a different design, and and the Eversource engineer who's been working in Framingham had a better design, and so Great. he wins. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> uh, so, but but cheaper, better, it, it's good. Um, so, but it's all about getting pressure on them to keep doing. It. They're not doing this because they're because of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because there's pressure on them from Lindsay Sabadosa. Who's been explicitly pressuring them uh, from uh, the fact that they've looked at Northampton because of our existing gas moratorium? They mm -hmm. see us as uh, uh, as a good candidate. Also, heat, uh, thermal diversity, and all that. But so, to the degree that the state is able to create more moratoria, then that puts more pressure on them to do the same thing. And of course they're gonna learn more as they as they do it in more places. Um, so to me, this makes sense. So that was my, my newsiness. The question is, this is explicitly something that we're asking, we would be asking the uh, city council to adopt? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it seems like then we should ask Marissa <laughs> if she has an opinion. <laughs> Yeah, it yeah. would be a recommendation for city council um, to adopt. Yeah. Sorry, about, Marissa, about, go ahead. Sorry, that's okay. So a, a vote today to, on a recommendation? Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, my vote would be, I would vote to yes on that. And, and we would do, do the recommendation, talk to Alex, uh, I mean the resolution and, and talk to Alex about getting it um, on the calendar. Uh, Denise, well, we will, I, I think you may have spoken to this, but I, um, as you can see, Debbie and I are uh, together in a park, so I may, I may have missed it, but the dates, the relevant dates um, for um, hearings in Boston that we need to know about so that we can move the resolution on in, in a timely fashion, um, we'll get yeah. it taken care of. I think this sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, I okay. agree. I'm on board with it too. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks yeah, for I, working into, into this. Debbie just said thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the work. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yes, and I don't know the date, the hearing dates. Um, I can get back to you on that though. Um, okay, great. Yeah. Um I would just offer that it probably makes sense to add um um a couple of additional paragraphs, one about the work of NESC and the sustainable and, and the plan um, for the city, as well as, um, you know, the um, mayor's policies and objectives to, to further enhance this resolution. Um, so if you're, so I mean, that would be my recommendation to add to it before it goes to city council. Yeah, I would take a recommendation, a vote, um, sorry, I wasn't called on. I would take a, a vote um, okay. to recommend today to be, uh, uh, that we should go forth and, and, and get the resolution in it, you know, as we want it to go to council ready. Not, not that we would be necessarily adopting as it's in place today. Um, okay. you know, we, we would, we would work, we would localize it. Any other comments? Um, Eric, go ahead. Um, sure. I, so the, the, I haven't, th this is the first time hearing about this. So I'm, I'm just reacting. Um, when you, when you introduce something like this, that's pretty a pretty significant change um, to infrastructure. And, and, and what I'm referring to is the other side of this. The, the electrification side of this is 
is not trivial in any way, shape, or form. The, the, the system that we currently operate for electricity is, is, you know, just working to serve where we are now. And the change to fully electrification is um, from the numbers I've seen from ISO New England uh, of late um, is almost a doubling of electricity demand. Um, and um, that is, is, is pretty dramatic. It means, it means that we need more generation, whether it's homes uh, producing solar power or large uh, grid scale renewable projects like offshore wind, uh, solar, which probably you all know is somewhat struggling a little bit for, for, for being able to build grid scale um, types of facilities. And so, you know, it's not, it's not trivial. And I think that in addition, you know, the economics of this is not trivial. So if you talk about $20 billion to, uh, um, you know, improve the, the quality of the gas distribution system, I, I can, I can assure you that increasing electric output in New England is uh, is uh, an order of magnitude or more <laughs> than than that to be able to serve to serve that load. Okay, so I'm getting to my point. My point is that we need to we we need to understand the other side of the electrification process. You can't you can't just say we got to get rid of gas and everybody's going to electrify you know their their homes for heating and 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 other you know thermal uses i mean industrial use of gas isn't going to go away necessarily um so i think if you're thinking about adding to this statement i think we need to be cognizant of the fact that even from a from a citizen standpoint the impacts of electrification are going to be pretty significant economically. It means people are gonna have to replace their heating systems with something different. And, um, you know, that's that's going to either, that's, you know, for low income, that's gonna require that we get access to subsidies to be able to fund those changes. Um, so I, I wanna try and see, can we, can we you know, I, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm uncomfortable making a blanket statement that we can just, you know, electrify the world. It's it's not as simple as that. And the costs are significant and the efforts to go into it for, you know, folks to find the resources to make that switch, I think are, are, are pretty significant. And, you know, I will also tell you that, you know, repowering the grid to serve all the load, you know, all the load that we're going to have is going to fall on ratepayers, right? That's not going to that that money isn't going to appear just because we're you know we're not spending money on fossil fuel. It's it's going to happen. So I, I don't know what words to put in this. I don't know. I just want to throw this out there that we have to be holistic in the kinds of recommendations that we make because it's rational from my from my viewpoint. Um, and I think that it shows that we're considering what you know, what the impacts are of this and and the things that we're going to have to consider to deal to deal with this. So I'll I'll uh, that that's my two cents. Um, and I, I I hope you I hope you can appreciate the perspective I offer I offer for this. Thanks, Eric. Um, let's go to Angie. Still muted. There we go. Um, thanks, Denise, and um, and I appreciate the the latter end of Eric's comment. Actually, the whole part of Eric's comment, I I definitely in, in agreement with. And I was a little when I first read the resolution. I think what what I flagged from it was maybe the fifth paragraph up from the bottom, 
that we would just create this strategic plan for the neighborhood by neighborhood transition. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that statement without the inclusion of something that would address how we would address this issue of um, you know, rate payers that are not homeowners, are below, you know, are low or moderate income and are cost burden because there is always a gap, even though there's the mass safe program and there's incentives and there's rebates, there's capital costs um, that residents need to incur. Um, and I think there are creative opportunities in the marketplace. I know um, there's the concept of um, tariffed on bill financing, um, which is something that of course the utilities would have to agree to. Um, and I have some more comments that I wanted to share later as we discuss the Mass Safe program. Um, but I think that was my biggest concern was that I think um, if, if we don't include it in the strategy part, um, it could it could get lost and um, and I think it's a real um, issue. Um, I would also provide the resource that um, Groundwork Data, which is a consulting company that actually has worked with the Energy Transition Institute at UMass Amherst to support their neighborhood by neighborhood um, and uh, analysis of like how to structure a transition um, in that same method by kind of reviewing the aging infrastructure, targeting certain areas. And um, and I think they, they might have the kind of technological support um, that could be a good reference for the community. Thanks, Angie. Um, ben. Uh, so I, I wanted to kind of respond to Eric's, um, uh, I guess, more, more technical description of, of the energy system and why I think that this particular approach um, should ameliorate some of his concerns. And, and that's specifically because we're not talking about a whole bunch of air source heat pumps. We're when we say neighborhood by neighborhood, we're talking about a utility that's providing uh, essentially a heat exchange uh, with, with the ground. And the reason why that's important is because air source heat pumps do their worst when it's coldest, right? That they, they, it's coldest out, their efficiency is the lowest. And so you create a large spike of demand on the grid at the very time when there's also pressure on the grid. Uh, in fact, often you will have, in order to keep pressure in the pipes, natural gas gets uh, routed towards, res you know, to combustion, direct combustion uses and away from the power plants. But if you're able to do that combustion in a power plant, right? So this is part of this long transition and we've got combined cycle natural gas power plants and a, essentially a ground source or a heat pump system where our efficiency is somewhere between four and six, hundred uh, percent efficient, <laughs> I should say, the co coefficient of performance. Uh, what that means is because it's, reacting to a relatively stable temperature, it's not going to spike in inefficiency like an air source heat pump does. So it actually acts to moderate that spike on the grid. And what that means is that more of that natural gas, which is going directly to a highly efficient electric uh, power plant, and then converting that into heat or transfer, using it to transfer heat in a much more efficient way, is, is actually lowering the impact on the grid. And this is different from uh, th throwing a whole bunch of air source heat pumps into the universe and then having a, a super cold and all of a sudden everyone's using oil at, on a power plant to try to use your, your heat pump at a coefficient of performance near two or maybe lower. So the detail of how the utility would do it. And the reason a utility would do it that way is because it's a market. It's their new business model, right? They're no longer selling gas. They're selling heat exchange. And they might and probably should. And I like what Angie said about um, on-bill financing um, or uh, other, other ways of including into their rate base the system, which in this case includes uh, pieces of equipment inside houses and commercial establishments and, and whatnot. Um, so I could see adding something to the resolution that talks about 
um, taking care that this that this new plan uh, accommodates uh, people's uh, inability to supply uh, capital up front for the transition, something like that. Um, but the the this concern about the capacity of the grid actually is is ameliorated the more we go to very very high efficiency heat pumps. Um, thanks. Um, I just, you know, the other thing just to bring back, um, the resolution does talk about air source and other methods. So I, maybe there's something in there that w could or should be adjusted to, um, talk about that as, and also there's still going to be a cost, obviously, even if it were ground source with transitioning people's systems within their home. So that's the big upfront cost that we have, we don't know yet from the utilities, you know, who would pay that or if they buy that and then you rent it essentially from the utility. Yeah. Um, there's that piece. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about, um, um, uh, that, um, is about the electric grid issues. And obviously I think everyone probably knows here that we, there's no longer, right now there's sort of a freeze on large scale solar because there's not capacity in the system. There's also this other piece that um, is disconcerting with that's coming up with level three, just level three charging capacity in this system. And that, you know, anyone who wants to go up and, and install level three chargers is, you know, there's a problem with the network just locally in Northampton and that National Grid is needing to add all these poles along the street network just for one or two level three chargers. So that's, there's that whole piece too, that's, I guess, more symptomatic of the, you know, the issue of the grid and not being able to handle the new demands on all this stuff. So that's a big problem. I think just sort of symptomatic of that, but um, so maybe this needs to be, I mean, I would suggest maybe it does need a little bit of massaging maybe to figure out and address those issues. But um, I just wanted to put that out there and then I'll go to, yeah, go ahead, Ben, and then Angie, and then, it's just, yeah. I wanted to get it while you brought it up because this is exactly the thing. And it's exactly the thing Eversource was talking to me about. Will DPU let us rate base this investment? That is to say, make everybody pay for it and put it onto this 30 year uh, bond, right? The reason they can afford to do things is because they can bond things out over a long time period. Um, yeah. If we were to put into this resolution something that says that it needs to include rate basing and encourage uh, uh, the um, re-conductoring uh, of existing transmission. <laughs> I know it sounds like a, a little detail, but- That's a new word, I think. It basically, we're, we're working mostly with 1890s technology for most of our uh, wires, but there are much, in existing right of on existing poles, you could replace those wires with newer, more highly conductive uh, wires, essentially. And it allows you to get more power through them. And that problem that you're describing, Carolyn, would solve that. Quite affordably, utilities tend not to want to do it because the DPU doesn't let them rate base it. They say, oh, you're not building anything new. You're just fixing your old stuff, but actually they're building something new because they're getting twice as much capacity out of something that exists. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, with the ground source. No, no, no. With, um, with, the, with reconductoring. This is, yeah, this I, is, I yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Angie, and then we'll go to members of the public. Yeah, I just had a follow up to your comment, Ben, about um, the inefficiency of the air source heat pumps and actually how it can create peaking. And, and I agree. So are you saying that then this resolution should only include ground source heat pumps and to be connected to this? Or, no. yeah, I just need more clarification. It's just that the, the business model for the utilities would involve most likely ground source. But there are going to be locations where that doesn't make sense. 
right? Right. Either the, the the neighborhoods are too spread spread too far apart, or the loads are so imbalanced, you know, that that, that you're not going to be able. You know, there there are reasons yeah. why ground source is not going to work in every place. Um, then I think, um, I, oh, Denise, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, just in response to all these comments, I, I, they're really good comments and they reflect the actual dilemma that we have, which is how to balance as we're shifting. Right. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be without problems. Um, and the resolution is not really a intended to deal with those problems. The resolution is just giving support to this legislation that says, all right, utilities, you need to move to figure this out and you need to move in such a way that we're not letting you profit off of building new infrastructure that lets you profit. We're going to ask you to do things in a better way, like um, better conducting wires, even if it doesn't mean that you're going to make a lot of money, right? <laughs> because your job is, you know, I mean, we allow them to make money, but we allow them to be monopolies because they're supposed to act in the public interest. <laughs> and so we're just pushing them a little bit to act more in the public interest. And, um, and then the details of this are going to take time. But until we start pushing to move forward, we're just going to stay where we are. And we have these goals and we need to meet these goals. <laughs> and so it's just um, baby steps to, you know, to push. And, and the city is going to be working with the utilities and the utilities who are both providing gas and electricity. And so they are very well positioned to, um, uh, get this balance, right? And even though it's not going to be easy, anyway. Thanks. Um, what is so? I think Marissa asked this earlier. What is um, the timeline for this um, legislation? Because we're getting close to the summer. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's the legislative session and I don't know exact, you know, usually it sort of goes really slow and then speeds up in it. And so I, I'm not even sure exactly one couple of these bills were still in committee anyway. And, and, you know, okay. we've had the disruption where there aren't being, there aren't joint meetings of the, anyway. Uh, so we're, uh, I'm not sure how quickly things will move once they get moving, but anyway, um, I, uh, because it's May already, and I, I wanted to get this to you because if you wait till June, you know, I, who knows where things will be by June and then going up to the city council because then it could be July and, you know, that's kind of cutting it close for the legislature. Yeah, I will also say that anything before June in front of city council probably won't be going anywhere <laughs> fast because they have other issues they're dealing with. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if it makes sense to massage this, um, given all the comments that um, have been discussed and bring it back to the next meeting. And then maybe it could go through city council at, um, in two readings or something like that. Um, and they'll be done, hopefully, with the budget discussions by that time. And so they'll have put that behind them and they can focus on something else. Okay. Marissa? Um, so, and so Denise, um, I can tell you, um, even, in, even in budget season, if we need to move something, we can, but, um, Alex, uh, is going to, you know, surely going to want to avoid putting something on if we don't have to. Um, so if you can get us the, the dates, any relevant dates, and because in particular, we would very much aim to have a resolution done and passed in time for any hearings or receipt of testimony and 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 we would go uh you know i would go testify uh in support of, of something like this uh, or debbie would or um and and be a part of that effort so so that part of it is just a matter of communication with us i mean if we hear that we can push it a little later in june uh i'm sure alex would be 
pleased to hear that. But if we if we need to, um, but if, if there are timelines that we need to, to know about, um, I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would accommodate that. But we we would have to have the resolution ready to go if we need to do another round of kind of approval through here. Um, you know, we just we need to be mindful of that. So. So my question is who, uh, so should I do the rewriting and who would I work with or um, does somebody there want to do the rewriting or? Um... Um, I would offer to do the rewriting because there's some city stuff and then there's, um, we can wrap in some other um, language um, for plans and objectives. So I'd be happy to do that and, and bring it back to the um, next meeting. Okay, great. And if, and if we find out, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, and if we find out that the timeline demands it, and it is something as as simple as we just need to approve it, um, we, we have, you know, convened, uh, you know, just to, to, to approve something um, yeah. when, we, when we've needed to. So um, um, the timeline really is important. We want to, this is, this strikes me as something that it could be really important to, to, to throw our weight behind and, and get some testimony in and make sure we have to have all that um so the part of yes. writing it and making it well you know consistent with what the this, this commit the commission wants to say um well we can make happen with whatever the timeline and we can write so if we needed to do like an extra emergency meeting just for this we just it would need 48 hours um notice so we could do that if it was if it came down to it Okay, any other comments about this? Anybody have any objections for pushing it off to another, to, to have some more work done on it? Okay, I see a comment or a hand raised for BJ. Yes, <clears throat> hello, I'm very new to this process and new to Northampton, but I just wanna speak in, in support of this resolution because I know there are gonna be a lot of difficult situations that arise as we move off of fossil fuels and try to increase our energy grid to support all the energy, the electric energy that we need, renewable energy that we need. But we have to take some steps. And this strikes me as something is a really important push in the right direction. And I really hope that, you know, it gets, it sounds like it's going to get resolved and passed. And I'm very pleased with that. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so um, I think um, we could, um, if I could get, probably the best thing is to get a motion on that to um, have staff work on the language based on comments and then bring it back to the next meeting and then we can vote on that. Okay, I'll, I would move to have staff work on the language based on comments and mm -hmm. then resolve at the next meeting. Second. Okay, so I'll take a roll call then. Um, uh, ben? Yes. Uh, Marissa? Yes. Uh, Deb? Yes. Eric? Yes. Angie? Yes. Louis? Yes. Um, Pat? Yes. And did I miss anybody? Oh, Tim, sorry. Yes. Anybody else? Okay, <laughs> I think that was unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the National Grid MOU. Um, Ben, I don't know if you've had any further conversations with them about the MOU since we met with National Grid. So, um, yeah, I mean, I um, can kick that off and then we can just do any gaps you want to fill in, it would be fine. So uh, National Grid um, actually reached out to us to um, ask um, if we'd be interested in talking about this new community um, partnership that they, um, I think, 
are um, encouraged to do across the Commonwealth with communities that are um, have plans for and targets for decarbonizing their um, public buildings. And they reached out to um, us staff to um, ask if we wanted to enter into this memorandum of understanding. And basically what it means is um, that they would help us, um, you know, on our targeted projects for buildings and decarbonizing, transitioning our public buildings off of fossil fuels. Um, and they would do that by a, a range of um, uh, providing incentives and sort of um, future um, um, discounts based on our transition and our energy loads um, to pay that and then also help us with federal and state grants in the form of actually helping us write those grants. They have grant writers on the team. They have a whole team of um, engineers and facilities people who would sort of put their heads together and figure out what the plan could be. Um, and so they met with Pat, myself, and Ben to talk about this and whether we'd be interested. And I think the consensus was, yes, we would. <laughs> We're very interested. So, um, and, the, and the other piece of it is that they're moving. So um, basically, National Grid is going to be the lead for the utilities in this area and I don't know if I think it's going to be very across the Commonwealth but basically right now even though we're gas and we're on Eversource the national grid will be the ones coordinating the transition from gas to electric um, starting in January of 2025 and so that's why they're sort of starting this conversation now um, in the hopes that you know in the next after six months, we're all set and ready to go. I will say that they've already, even though we haven't signed an MOU, they've already started to provide us resources to support, um, you know, uh, processes and in fact, specifically helping um, with grant writing assistance. So it's really kind of an, um, um, of, I would say an exciting, um, exciting opportunity sort of out of the blue. And um, I think as long as they're offering it, it makes sense for us to take it. But I'll turn it over to Pat and Ben because they were both in the conversation and they might have more to add. You get anything, Pat? I do not, sorry. <laughs> I mean, Carolyn did a really good job summarizing it because it is extensive. It's really, it seems like it's really about creating this relationship and a one-stop, uh, you know, or, or a first-stop shop for, with them where we can kind of like try to get all the resources together in one place. And and um, and they're offering a bunch of things. Um, it, among them is potentially a part uh, or a half, half of a full-time equivalent person to do essentially uh, energy outreach to... Uh, um, uh, commercial and residential uh, uh, users. So that's another thing that I'm kind of really interested in. How, how do we take advantage of that? Um, you know, where might the other half, <laughs> half of the person be funded from? Uh, that sort of thing. And I don't have any answers to that yet. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if, you, if you've got anything thing else is that's just a this is just reporting out right uh, carol yeah and just that it's like to be continued and forthcoming i mean i think they sent us um, um an outline of what the mou would look like and um yeah it's i think um i like the way you put it is sort of um just sort of a one-stop place where all the people in the room that need to be in the room to sort of think about how we take you know building X um, off of natural gas and, um, you know, what are the steps to that and how can they facilitate that happening? And it, it, it the, the thing that's kind of mind blowing to me is we've been struggling over the last several months of trying to figure out this thing for, you know, Forbes Library and the Hub and, 
you know, along with all the other buildings, but really that was sort of uh, an acute issue that we're dealing with now because we're in design for the hub. And um, it just seemed wildly complicated because on the one hand, Eversource was saying, oh, well, you could do this. And then National Grid was saying, yeah, that's a good idea. And then all of a sudden it's like, there's just one voice in the room that will be sort of the, the well, the potentially guiding <laughs> potentially, because, of course, they are yeah. different companies, you know, so just to riff on this, essentially, there's one model in which Eversource operates a thermal utility in downtown Northampton, starting with the hub and Forbes and the little bit of residential stuff in between as their little mini utility and then expand it. And National Grid sells electricity to both to all the entities. Yeah. There's another model where National Grid operates that utility. I mean, part of what I want to talk about to them on, we're having a meeting with them on the 22nd to kind of like keep this moving forward. I think it's the 22nd, might be the 21st. Um, and, you know, I kind of want to say, hey, do you want to run this thermal utility? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, right. to, to light a fire under Eversource if they're not going to do it. Um, right. So, yeah, it, it, it could be, they could be playing one against the other, but it's a lot more potential than there was, what, two months ago? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And so, yeah, it's simply just an update to NESC of where, you know, this, you know, late breaking um, new pathway potentially. And um, of course that we would keep you posted. Um, any other questions on that before we move to the next item? Okay. It looks like Denise. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Oh, I don't see. Sorry, well, I didn't, maybe I didn't, not your virtual hand, hand. your regular hand. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so I, maybe it's just the cynic in me, um, but I, I'm. I, it makes me a little anxious um, to hear, like you know whose decision make, I don't know what this memorandum of understanding is gonna say, but um, but the other thing is I'm wondering about the CCA and how, how this would work if you had this provider, does that mean that those people wouldn't be part of the CCA? I don't know how that all will work. It, it, it's two separate things, right? The CCA is, is electricity provision, not distribution and billing <laughs> essentially so it's it's kind of the two halves of your bill all right um so next um energy coaching um and the and national grid again topic <laughs> um and east hampton i didn't send across the announcement for that but i don't know if um i know that angie you wanted to talk about that and i think um ben too we were talking a little bit about energy coaching so either one of you feel free yeah i just had a quick a quick thing um i've participated a little bit in the um public listening the public comment listening sessions that doer has um, been hosting they've had three of them or they're about to have three they've had two already one in march and april um, and then they'll have one in June. Um, but the other, the other thing just around that, cause I know that came out of a public comment for the, for Nest to consider how we could support energy coaching. Um, and it sounds like maybe Net Mass Save is now going to be providing that hands-on support. So I just didn't know if it'd be worth the time and energy of this committee to strategize and implement energy coaching. Um, but it was just something that I had heard through um, a recent presentation given by CET. Um, and yeah, and so that was my thought on energy coaching, but I have more around just mass save in general when we get to that topic. I mean, I, I, I wanted to just have the discussion item at, to, to see kind of what people were thinking. So it, this was, for many months, um, Adele and Eric um, and a, a bunch of, of people, uh, kind of uh, activists in the community, have been generally pushing for um, 
energy coaching. And my response has always been, well, where's, where's, it, where's the money going to come from? Who's, who's going to do it? And will it be effective at a large enough scale? You know, how do you, how do you make that happen? Um, and I feel like potentially with, if national grid is going to fund part of a position and then if there were a way to organize something along the lines of solar eyes or heat smart you know we're, we're using volunteers to also get get people out plus targeting in other words you can't just kind of go willy-nilly at everyone with energy coaching because you just don't have enough resources but if we could use some of the targeting that, for instance, Rachel um, Stevens uh, it shared with us the, a few meetings meetings back, you know that those things might all come together into targeting energy coaching uh, at you know the the right users where it's going to be um, co most cost effective and where they might have the most confusion about how to get access to the right mass save resources and all the other resources and, and so all of that um the other development which isn't yet uh like we don't know who the um operator will be is that mass cc has announced an rfp for um someone to operate a northampton east hampton heat pump program which is funded by the settlement from Eversource that was Columbia Gas from uh, the explosions back east, uh, you know, however many years ago that was. So that's the the origin of this. So kind of a, another mother's out front uh, <laughs> um, rela relationship. Uh, so when that, when they select a provider, that's going to be someone who's targeting spe most specifically lower income and rental units or, you know, or uh, tenants um, as places to try and implement heat pumps and energy efficiency. And there may be a way to coordinate with that entity that, that wins that contract. Um, Adele. So one of the reasons that we have been asking to have this put on the agenda is that so many communities have energy coaching programs and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can look at those other programs, some of which are entirely volunteer run. So it doesn't require any municipal funding. Um, and and we can decide as a city uh, which model we think would work here. Is there any any um, advantage to waiting until DOER comes back with how the program is going to run from twenty twenty five to twenty twenty seven? Because what if what if there's different incentives or if the program structure is different? Um, or is it worth? Which I don't know. are we talking about? Mass Save or which program? Yeah, the Mass Save program. Because I'm assuming that's what we're energy coaching on, right? How people can take advantage of the energy efficiency um, program. I think it's got to be more than that, though. Like Mass Save oh. plus other resources. But, and I guess my response to to that would be. Well, it's got to be something that's durable, right? That's going to adapt to whatever happens to mass save each time. You know that it's that it's going to last longer than a three year cycle, potentially. Or, or you could say it's it's a one time, you know, hard uh, shot. That also makes sense, I suppose. Do you have a particular idea on that? Well, um, I think I think it goes back to one of my original comments. I'm just like, who are we targeting and how can we best serve them? Um, and if, you know, the majority of people who are already finding their way and taking advantage of the of the most meaningful incentives that are offered, um, do we focus our energy on helping those who haven't been able to reach them? And how do we do so? And what are the resources that they need actually to be able to participate? 
Um, and, and how can we facilitate any kind of um, response to that need that is meaningful to them, right? If we just show them administratively, oh, these are the steps you take, but we don't address the, this is how you can access the capital you don't have, or the risk you don't want to take of your personal finances, or um, the fact that you can't even consider this as an option. Um, I just feel like if we create an energy coaching program, are we just serving those who can access it? And yes, that's still helping the general movement and, and that's great, but does that then make it seem that we're ignorant to the fact that there are other people who, you know, and I think this came up earlier in Denise's presentation that, that the whole idea of doing this is to support those who will be left behind, not carrying the full burden of the natu of, um, natural gas um, because they're the only ones left using it. Um, so those costs become higher for them. So I know we all care about this issue and I think it's a bigger problem than this commission needs to solve. But I think I don't want us to come across as ignorant or um, just ill-equipped to try to address that issue. So my thoughts. Carolyn, this is Eric. Can I, can I jump? I'm all hearing you. Carolyn, um, can yeah. I jump in? Um, sure. Oh. Um, okay. Can you, if you can't hear me, I won't talk. No, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it would make sense. Um, I think you're breaking up. So <laughs> I, I, I like this idea of trying to support energy users in ways that are, are helpful. Okay. Okay. I'll pass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you could put it in the chat, maybe if it's not too long. <laughs> um, Louis, I I wonder how um, what Mass Save has to offer, and I wonder if we could get uh, somebody from Mass Save to um, come to one of our meetings and give us a ten minute um, um, uh, presentation on what they can do. I mean, I know what I, I see them do. Um, and I know what they have contractors that are sort of keyed towards, um, we mostly see the insulation and air sealing people, um, but what can they do? And are we trying to reinvent the wheel? Um, are we running a parallel path with an energy coach? Um, or alternately, do we need a, an energy coach that doesn't um, do what, doesn't propose to do what Mass uh, Save is already doing? Well, I also wonder if for this program, and maybe we don't know yet because they're not quite done <laughs> flushing it out, but um, is it really going to provide the, um, not even just incentives, but financial support for people who need that the most? I mean, there's, you know, there's, you break it down into two categories, people, or maybe three, people who really will be stretching to adopt these, um, but these incentives will really help and more incentives will be better. And so coaching them on how to get those makes sense. Um, then there are people who, it doesn't matter, they'll figure it out and they have the means to do it. And then the other category is people who, the incentives just you know, aren't there. If you're on a restricted income, you still can't, you know, even if you have, a low interest loan or a no interest loan, you're still paying for this thing that you might not ever be able to afford. And so um, I wonder if there's enough information, there are enough incentives out there to target. I mean, I know this green bank that the state has um, um, established, you know, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the piece is that it's targeted to direct people to access that um, new fund that the Commonwealth established. But I think that um, it probably, 
those are sort of questions out there that I would have is sort of how, what would be those the targets and is it effective even um, yet with the resources? So, uh, in a, you know, that's maybe separate than the mass safe focus or this, you know, East Hampton. Um, I mean, maybe in the East Hampton thing, I think is probably targeted um, similarly, but to um, uh, ten residents in in multifamily um, rental situations as well. So that's even a little bit different. So yeah, it's low income, and it it doesn't. It's not clear to me that it addresses the split incentives problem. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, which is the usual. Okay, Denise. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that maybe um, multiple. Um, uh, there could be like parallel programs. Like we could have multiple coaching things, and uh, there are different models. Rewiring America. I just did this um, coaching training thing, <laughs> and you, um, you know, that's designed for certain groups of people, and uh, and and it's a little bit of technical. Uh, material, but mostly uh, helping people think through their long-term goals, how they can like little by little, you know, change their life. Um, and then you need a whole other program for people who are renters um, that's reaching out to landlords. And, um, uh, you know, it seems like uh, there are a variety of programs and maybe rather than having one program that can do all of these things, you can have like one that's volunteer run that directs people in, a, you know, people who are already on top of things, but a little overwhelmed. And then, you know, we've got all these other groups. So um, I don't know, I would say um, there could be lots of angles and approaches. Okay, any other comments? Can I try this again? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Okay. I'm I'm in the car. I'm hunting food for my family. My daughter just had another baby this morning. So I'm I'm a little anyway. Um my I, it does it make sense to write down sort of establish sort of what we're trying to achieve with this energy coaching and that you know from there I think sort of the flow of to whom this type of activity would go to and and then you know the content I think of what goes in. Because my I, I may have a different picture about what energy coaching is. I mean, I think any energy user needs coaching in some way or shape or form. And I think with the community choice aggregation coming to us soon. I think there's even more reason to think broader about what energy coaching could be because there are opportunities to provide folks with a better understanding of um, um, being responsive in, in their energy consumption practices to things like price um, or peak. And so there's a lot, there's a lot more to this. Um, so I, my suggestion is that we kind of establish a working document that, so that we have a common understanding of what we're actually trying to achieve here. That, that, that's my contribution there. I heartily second that. Does that mean you're volunteering to start the framework for that working document of what your idea is and then people can pile on? Can we do that without breaking open meeting law? Yes. Well, no, if I, I mean, have pile to, on at the I'll subsequent help. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, distribute it for the next next meeting or the meeting after, and then at each meeting we can massage it. I think that makes sense. You know, I I I heard what Adele said about well, there are these other communities that have been doing this. Um, I you know I would like to know well what were their goals. Um, how, you know, how did they organize it? What were their goals? And were they successful? And essentially, was that success? How are they measuring success? Um, which would depend on their goals. And that might at least give us a sense of like, 
what are we talking about here? Because I I will admit that I'm a little unclear as to really what we're really talking about. All right, so another agenda item for an upcoming meeting will be a first attempt at under, uh, defining what those goals are. Okay, great. Okay, um, do we want to, the other item was mass save. Did we talk enough about that in this last, um, or do we want to go in deeper about mass save? No. I mean, okay. I just had some quick numbers that um, that I thought were interesting that um, somebody had researched just in terms of, uh, just to give us some numbers to wrap our heads around if, if we wanted to, but it seems like about 18% of the total project cost is what is what the average customer has to cover up front, which ends up being about $6,200. So it's not anything insignificant. Um, and 28% of people reported that the upfront capital was the biggest barrier to energy efficiency and electrification for them. 80% um, of the people who were able to access meaningful incentives live in homes above the median value and more than 95% of incentives go to homeowners. So whereas a third of the utility customers are renters, 42% um, residents are low to moderate income and two thirds of those are cost burdened. So I think it's just more, to like, you know, wrap our heads around the fact that that maybe this program is not as equitable as we would hope, even though every single ratepayer is paying um, into it at the same rate. So, great, thanks. Um... Ben had a question. Yeah, I, I I mean I do have, have a question, which is, you know, again, we don't run mass save, but we're a city. So are there things that a city can do to deal with? So look, you know, to me, the, the big issue with renters is the split incentive problem. The landlord, if if you're the, the tenant paying your utility bills, the landlord has no incentive to lower your uti utility bills. And conversely, if uh utilities are included in rent, then the landlord can just as easily raise the rent as, instead of lower their own utility bill. So it may, depends on them being just a nice person, uh, which is nice, but you know, not dependable. Um, it, you know, so that's the, the essence of the split incentive. Is there anything that could be done at a city level? You know, like what we do is make policy in here, right? Or it, suggest policy that would address that. Um, you know, whether it's create an incentive, create a model lease, uh, provide a model lease with some sort of property tax benefit associated with adopting it. I mean, I'm spitballing. <laughs> Those are interesting ideas. I wonder, is there anything with the forthcoming community choice aggregation that could potentially include a way to support this. I don't know. Um, I think about that in terms of like the tariff on bill financing is typically done through um, municipal light districts of which we are not, but I don't know if becoming a CCA, we somehow adopt another kind of um, identity profile that would allow for us to, to leverage some of the, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I don't really understand this. <laughs> <laughs> and how it works, what the what the city mechanisms are, but I mean, I don't, I don't know either. I don't know that we could. Um, yeah, I mean, I think maybe the question is with our to sort of think about it with the CCA and talk to, um, you know, communicate that, you know, pitch that question to the consultant to see if that's something that, um, you know, could be done. Um, because I, otherwise I don't, I, I mean, I don't know enough about it, um, either, but, um, sometimes the super creative solutions actually are not legal. 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> it, may, it might be the answer is there's nothing we can do at the municipal level. Like you have to be a state legislature. And if that's the case, great. We've learned that. And that's yeah. we're not the right place to operate. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. So next up, um, I can't, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I don't remember who asked to have the landscape subcommittee put on as an agenda item. Does anybody remember who did that? I did. I, I had okay. asked. Um, I just kind of wanted to keep that conversation alive from last time because I felt like it was very productive and, and there, there, um, there tends to be a lot of airtime, you know, and, which makes sense on this commission for um, energy related or energy efficiency related topics. And, um, I think because some of those, you know, are have longer time horizons. Um, maybe there's some other work that we can be doing um, in the short term in our landscape for climate adaptation as we as we await some of these larger um, levers of um, decarbonizing our building and heating and cooling. Um, so, yeah, and I, I liked what you had said before, Ben, about maybe maybe this is an opportunity for our city staff of, on this commission to come forward with some of the, the challenges or obstacles that they have and see how we can kind of rally support or um, be thought partners for them. So I was thinking about that in terms of landscape. I don't know what the objectives are currently for city-owned property. Um, and, and if, you know, similar to doing like an energy audit on our buildings to kind of assess where we can improve, like, is there a parallel activity to be done in the landscape where we can kind of audit some of the practices for maintenance and upkeep and implementation of, you know, green infrastructure for stormwater management or things like that, um, that could also be kind of staged out in a plan or something like that and who can do this and can we rally volunteers just same same it's like parallel to what we're, we're having conversations about here around energy is like i'm sure there's also very eager um community members willing to volunteer their time to help support that it doesn't have to become a burden on the staff so that's why i put it on there thanks i mean i know last time there was a discussion and um you know with both members of the public and um, Tim was um, talking about sort of this, where we are now and the status of the pollinator plant um, seeds and, and spreading that. So I don't know if it, um, uh, you know, potentially it makes sense if there's like particularly a project like either doing an inventory or continuing that conversation of connecting the high school with um, plant, you know, doing this pollinator planting if the subcommittee, if that subcommittee wants to be re-energized for meeting and sort of talking about that, those processes for implementation or auditing or what have you. So I don't, it, um, I'm wondering if that's sort of the next logical step to sort of establish and if someone wants to spearhead the landscape subcommittee um, or something like that, if it's landscape you know, um, and habitat subcommittee, what have you. Um, is that something that um, makes sense for the group or is that what you were sort of um, thinking about, Angie? Yeah, I think that's a great path forward, but I would just want it to be something that, that Tim would also be interested or finding that, that Tim sees that as a path of support and not a path of burden. So I, I don't want to say like, we should do this thing and let's do it. <laughs> manage it. So I just <laughs> kind of wanted to assess, you know, what's already been talked about at the DPW level or whatever, you know, like, I don't, I don't really know what the status is and what has already been discussed. Yeah. Um, and I think we also, um, Rich is at a conference today, so he's not able to sort of give that DPW perspective today. Um, so um, go ahead, Ben. Oh, uh, that was actually what I wanted to ask about. Is it seems like it would make sense to connect with Rich? I don't know. He used to have, I maybe mean, still does have, like a tree working group or something like that. Um, that was not related to this, but was like a different one. Do, do you, does anyone know if that's still happening? You, you mean Tree Northampton, like the volunteer group, or 
urban forestry I know, it, I know it involved <laughs> residents and it involved okay. grit. <laughs> and that's about all I know. Okay. Well, um, you know, maybe, maybe we should um, sort of, I, I think, so previously, I think it was Tim and Rich and Councilor Maori, and I don't know if there was someone else who was on that subcommittee. So maybe when um, I could just put a plug in for Rich to make sure he clears his schedule for the next meeting so we can talk as a group as to whether it makes sense, whether it's supporting the, um, both Tim and Rich in their efforts. Um, and then also sort of circling back um, if there's support needed to sort of um, connect the dots between Tim and you know the group at the high school or if that's already underway and so we don't need to worry about that but um, you know happy to put that um, put that plug in for Rich and see if, if that will work for the next meeting. Um, all right so any counselor updates? From the two counselors on the road, are they still with us? <laughs> We're here. No, we Okay. Uh, uh, you want to talk? Uh, yeah, just that um, the um, pain stewardship. Um, they're going to the Ways and Means Committee next week with the Thomas Irwin, the guy who sponsored it with us or brought it to our attention. So, um, and he has enough uh, community signed on. He has well over forty-one now. So. Do that as well, and council did pass that resolution. Yes, great unanimously. Okay, great. Uh oh, you're frozen. Were you gonna anything else? I was just gonna say nothing else but budget right now. That council passed the resolution and everything else is budget. Right okay. Now. Okay. Great. Yeah, Thank you too. Actually. Great. Um all right. Um department heads. Pat, I'm gonna pick on you first. Yeah, anything? I don't, I don't really have anything, no, other than the okay. meeting that you discussed. Okay. Um, Louie, anything? No, I'm good for now. Well, I could complain about um, the energy code if I think for several hours at this point, um, but I'm not going to. I'll just struggle okay. through. So, well, let me just say one thing. It's probably going to take me longer to look at the energy code aspect of a very small building than it will be to do the whole um, rest of the plan review for another, for a, a, a similar sized building. Okay, that doesn't bode well for anybody in the Commonwealth. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's it's got to happen. It's it's I think a question of pushing design people um, to to simplify rather than um, obfuscate their, <laughs> their plan <laughs> review. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't really have any updates. Um, nothing from, um, our department, um, except that, um, you know, it, it's citywide, not necessarily our department. Everybody must know it's bike week this week. So, um, um, lots of stuff going on and we're, we've got a first report for, um, from Drop Mobility, our bike share provider. They've inventoried all the bikes and sort of categorized them. They're well on their way to, um, you know, um, establishing uh, probably close to 300 bikes that are gonna be road worthy very soon. Um, so it's all, for me, it's super exciting because they've gotten in there with high energy, been working really hard sort of organizing everything that was just dumped in the warehouse um, that we had to then move to another warehouse. Um, so um, that's like big stuff going on. And we're just um, in terms of other projects, you know, we're working um, on um, 
picture Main Street, we're almost ready to issue the 75% uh, design plans. MassDOT still reviewing um, those comments, but um, yeah, we're plugging along um, with that. So that's all I have. Can I ask a quick question, Carolyn, on like just the hiring process for the two positions in your department? Um, yes, is that my department? Kappa, is that what you're talking about? I don't about? know. Yeah, yeah, the people okay. we lost. You know, we lost <laughs> the um, people we lost. Yes. Yeah, the people Carol, we lost who used to be on this commission. Yeah. Carol and Josh. So, well, Ben is going to be the interim director for Kappa um, starting at the end of May. And I believe the hiring is complete for the energy officer who will also be in that department. Yep. Um, and also starting at the end of May, is that correct, Ben? That is true. I am okay. starting on May 27th and Gabrielle Fox is starting on May 28th. <laughs> okay, so that's really exciting news. Um, and um, yeah. Um, and there's, a, we'll, the, there'll be lots of work <laughs> out of the box, so. Um, the last thing I have on the agenda are minutes from April 9th, so I just need um, a motion to accept the minutes as part of the record. Motion to accept the minutes as part of the record. Second. Is that Marissa or Deb? That's me, okay. Marissa. Okay. Marissa, thanks. Okay, I'll do a roll call. Uh, Marissa? Yes. Deb? Yes. Um, Angie? Yes. Ben? Yes. Pat? Yes. Um, Louis? Yes. Uh, Tim? Yes. Did I get everybody? And I guess I'll vote yes too. Okay, so that's unanimous. That's the end of the agenda. Um, any other items before we sign off? Okay, great. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day and week and we'll see you soon.